All right, the title of this lecture is Taphonomy, which is a way of studying how things become fossils. And so we start again with Darwin's question, how good is the fossil record? And really, from Darwin's day until the 1980s, uh, which is well over a century, this was just answered with, uh, it's imperfect. Starting in the 1980s, we started getting more and more researchers wanting to answer the question, how does something become a fossil? And look more at the, not just the fossils in hand, but the whole way they look to see how they might be preserved. There also were a bunch of people that looked at modern things and how they got buried or not buried and how that might affect uh, their ultimate preservation. So start with the word taphonomy. And as said before, this is the study of how a living organism dies and ultimately becomes preserved. And you can see this uh, set of four diagrams here. You've got a dinosaur that dies, gets buried, all kinds of things happen to the rock, and ultimately sometime millions of years in the future, a scientist was able to collect the thing as it's weathering out of the ground. But first, let's look at dying. Uh, everything that lives or has ever lived on planet Earth has died or will die. And usually you cannot tell how things died or distinguish them in any way, shape, or form. Look at that hungry male lion down there gorging himself on a beast that he or one of his um, associated females probably recently killed. And both the kill marks and then the eating marks can be potentially preserved in the bones like this. And so sometimes you can look at a preserved specimen like the bone that you see in the upper picture and you can tell that a large carnivorous animal has both bit into it and gnawed on it and to make this fossil preserved this way. So this lump of hard part preserves some extra information, some biological information on it that we wouldn't normally have. And another thing to think about is that the lion that's eating a particular organism is going to have a different set of marks on it than a different organism. So here you've got one female lioness and she's gorging herself on this, uh, I guess it looks like a buffalo, a bison, and then you have a whole field of hyenas here. They're probably about to scare her away, but they would leave completely different traces for this. And again, many times these things can be found in the fossil record. And it's not just, again, the sexy stuff like these vertebrates. Remember, what's more common in the fossil record are simple shelly beasts like mollusks. And the thing that you're looking at on the uh, left side is a clam shell. And this particular little bullseye hole right here on the, off on the sort of leftish side represents a drill hole that this particular snail, um, it's called a moon snail or a polynices, did to eat it and kill it. What happens is the living snail today will slime its way slowly but surely over the top of one of these clams and then it has a strong um, tooth covered tongue and then it can also release uh, various digestive acids and it will sit there and it takes its time, it's a snail, and slowly scrapes and dissolves away a hole. Once it pokes through, it can inject digestive juices in here, starts dissolving, basically killing the clam and then sucking it up. At some point, it sucks all the meat out of there and then leaves and you have a beautifully preserved shell still with the mark of what killed it. And so a predation, tra a predation trace can identify the predator. And snail shells can make different types of holes, shapes of holes, depending upon the type of the snail. So you can tell what killed a particular organism uh, by the, the hole shape that they leave. Or you can tell that uh, they didn't 
quite go all the way through. So this clam right here, you see up in the upper part, a remnant of a, a drill job that started, but for whatever reason, it stopped and moved on. It's called a failed predation. So notice we're seeing examples of behavior, even in the most common simplest of, of fossil objects, these shells. Here's some more biotic interactions. We have gastropods, snails, like the organism here on the extreme left. They have a great fossil record. We have lots and lots of fossil snails. Remember that my little uh, pie chart of the mollusks. Compare that to crabs. Crabs have a very fair, and that's being generous, fossil record. Why the difference? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons here, but one thing that we find more of for crabs, we find evidence of them destroying gastropod shells more than we find any evidence of fossils of the whole bodies of these crabs. Here you see a couple of snail fossils. We know that mollusks have a good fossil record, but there's a difference between these two. One, what you see on this one here is that the shell has been broken back and it's chipped in a particular way that we know that crayfish or crawfish uh, do this, crabs do this, lobsters do this, shrimps with large claws do this. They love to eat a meaty snail and they literally go up, grab them, and start uh, snipping away this large part of the aperture till their claw can reach in and pull the meat out. And we actually give the name of this type of breakage C. dickness. So again, it, it's a piece of a skeleton and it gives us evidence of obviously the organism itself, the snail, but a break on it, a snip on it, gives us paleobiological evidence of a completely different creature that interacted with it when it was alive. Again, another good example how you can tease apart something from our very thin fossil record. So now let's look again at the pathway of particular organisms or types of organisms. And we can begin with the simplest case. The simplest case is actually something like a snail that has what we say is one element. It has a one piece skeleton. And so you've got the living animal over here. You can see the shell and there's the little snail. And then if you follow the arrows, these are all the different things that can happen to it. Notice ultimately right off the bat, aerobic bacteria destroy any soft tissue. And this upper set here between dissolving and being destroyed by scavengers or, or just moved around results in complete destruction. Sadly, that is the fate of almost all of the um, hard parts that ever exist on planet Earth. They're completely destroyed. But now what happens? They can either be buried immediately in the sediment, or they can be transported, moved a certain distance, and then buried somewhere else. And so notice things that have been moved a good amount of distance then buried, they tend to not be preserved that well things that are buried immediately, let's say what it's called residence time. So how long did they sit on the seafloor? If they get buried immediately, then they stand the chance of being all of those things we talked about before, a replacement, a recrystallization, a permineralization. So there's one uh, model, the model for a one element skeleton. And paleontologists have done these things for so many different types of organisms. Here's a simple two element pathway. If you think about a clam, uh, but also things like brachiopods, they have two uh, pieces of hard part. And the very first thing that happens to them usually is what we call disarticulation. The two parts separate and then they get preserved as separate things. So here the living organism is this clam in the middle and it can be disarticulated and then it can be immediately buried or it can be transported, broken, busted up, and then maybe get buried. 
or it can be buried right away and we'll get exceptionally well-preserved hard and soft parts or normally just these hard parts here. So notice every author kind of does this a little bit differently than the other one, but you still get the idea that an organism's alive, it dies, and then a whole series of processes can happen to either destroy it or ultimately preserve it. Well, that's another simple case. What about if we have a multi-element pathway? The picture you're looking at here is from a classic old German paleoecology book uh, in which this guy looked at all kinds of dead fishes and birds and things uh, on the shores in uh, Denmark, I believe. And here you've got a fish. Now, a fish is like us. There are hundreds of bones in here. So there are hundreds of elements. And what happens to your average fish that dies in a shallow uh, coastal bay in Denmark, they slowly get um, digested by bacteria, which produces a lot of gas, which can gas this creature up. So from step one to step two, which then allows it to float and be moved by waves and currents, and it can travel very, very far. And it is continually being destroyed by this bacteria. Uh, and then other creatures might eat it, the waves start tearing it apart, at some point it degasses and it will fall back down to the sediment here. Now here they're all shown in one spot, but obviously this, he tracked this for some of these for many kilometers down the beach. And after one month, some of these ones he followed after one month, uh, he had a pile like this. You see, this is a slightly different story than what you have with a simple invertebrate type skeleton. Vertebrates, like us, like this fish, have skeletons with hundreds of elements and they tend to be disaggregated and destroyed like this. And I'll tell you right now, a vertebrate paleontologist would look at this array of, of bones right here and they would be overjoyed because these are at least what we call associated. You can tell that they are um, likely all from the same creature. Sadly, for vertebrate fossils and vertebrate remains, this notion of transport does a real number on them. So if we look here at this picture and this description of post-mortem transport, this dinosaur has died and fallen into a river system. The river system moves it. Let's say it ultimately all decays here. And then you just have all these both bodies and bones moving downstream. And this is the typical vertebrate fossil deposit one encounters. Uh, can you tell how many organisms that's from? Can you tell how they died? Can you tell um, much of anything from this? Yes, you can, but it's very, very different, and it's a very sad state compared to invertebrate paleontology. So first of all, vertebrates are not preserved as well. Just the fact, go back to this slide, the fact that this dinosaur happened to die by a river where his or her remains are in this fluvial system and getting buried is miraculous in and of itself. If this dinosaur had died 100 feet over to the right or to the left, it would have sat there and ultimately getting completely destroyed, just like that deer on the side of the highway. So even in the best of circumstances, vertebrates on land tend to be preserved as a mess like this. We do find exceptions. There are, of course, whole body fossils of even things as spectacular as dinosaurs laying there. Very, very rare. Very rare. And so we talk about the loss of data. So this diagram, I like this one, it starts at the top. We have the life assemblage. So this is all the organisms living in a particular area and the study of how they interact, how they live, that's paleoecology. We will talk about that. Ultimately, not all of them are preserved. So notice what's going to happen here. The little stippled or dotted um, wedges are going to get smaller and smaller. The number of things that die and have hard parts, it's about 50%. So they are potentially at least becoming fossils. 
Here's a weird word, biostratinomy. That's just a stupid word. It was invented to talk about how these things all move around and get dumped somewhere. Not everybody uses it. But the death assemblage, the, the list of bodies and bones and teeth and shells that uh, could be there gets whittled down even further till we have the total fossil assemblage, the total percentage of things that have become fossils. And then we'll talk about this last, this thing here, diagenesis. Look at the name, dia, dual, secondary, genesis, dual life. Really, it's, it's dual death uh, in our case here because this is saying that even if all these things happen, and let's say that dinosaur bone gets buried and it's made it as into as a fossil, it's going to sit there for millions of years and potentially it is going to secondarily get dissolved and destroyed. So that by the time you're way down here, you should have drawn a little paleontologist beside this box, where somebody is actually collecting it, you are looking at a percentage, 10% maybe, of what was originally there. Okay. So let's look at a unique example that happened in my backyard uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of winters ago now. Uh, I came out into the backyard and looked. It was, a, it was winter, it was snowy, and there were piles of guts and remains all over the place. And so here I am pointing at it. This is sort of sections of intestine here. There's also big chunks of bone. You can see the blood in the snow. Uh, you go a little bit farther down the line and I see, well, here's a leg attached to part of a body. There's part of a head. Here's another whole leg here. And you can probably see the feet on this thing. This was uh, a rabbit. So it died, clearly, and it clearly was attacked and um, destroyed, eaten mostly by some organism here. If you go a little bit farther in one of my small ponds, it was frozen over. There's even more remains. And then look at this sort of blizzard of tracks all around this thing. So this thing and this, this total spread from that first slide that I showed from here to this pond that's probably about 30 feet with body parts all along the way. Blood and gore everywhere along the way. Close up here, here's these feet again. Here's uh, the spinal cord is, is underneath this piece of flesh right here. And then the tracks themselves are pretty interesting. A lot of good um, rabbit tracks, they're pretty common. I see those in the snow all the time. But then a lot of tracks that look like this. And the inference is that this organism that made these tracks was clearly the organism that did the uh, carnivorous pursuit and destruction and eating of the organism here. So this is, it's a trace fossil. Now, obviously the snow melted, it disappeared, but I have a photographic record of it now. And so there is a record of this thing. And so there's a lot of work that's been done by zoologists on tracks and trails. And I went uh, upstairs to the bio folks and had them uh, look at all my pictures of these things. And we figured it out that it was the weasel, the genus Mustella. There's a whole bunch of different species here. But some weasel encountered a rabbit in my backyard and did this number on them. I collected all these pieces of debris and bones and took them up to the bio lab. They have this thing called a dermestid box. The dermestids are little beetles that eat flesh. Uh, and I put the bones in there. Uh, we let them eat this flesh over a period of several weeks. They clean it off and just leave you the cleaned bones. But you have preserved gnaw marks and bite marks from this weasel on it. And I saved it as just an example of the potential of paleontology. So clearly a biotic interaction happened. It left a scene with some hard parts and evidence. And if it, you could imagine a different situation where instead of being snow in someone's backyard, some ancient mustelid 20 million years ago did this on the edge of a little pond, 
stepped in the mud along the way and preserved tracks and trails and all these things here. I'm going to show you the um, the bones that were remained uh, that remained for us uh, in the lab. But that's the end of this first part of the taphonomy lecture. The next part wraps up the science for us, and we'll be doing a good lab on this this week. So uh, just, again, something to make you think about how things get preserved and how even though there is tremendous destruction and loss of data, we still have a lot to work with.